Hello and welcome to another PMP Live. My name is Bashan. I'm part of the event staff, Politics and Pros. Uh, before we do begin this event, just have to go over a couple of quick items. First is that at any time during this event, if you would like to ask a question of either one of our authors, um, we would ask for you to put it into the Q&A box, which you can find towards the bottom of your screen if you move your cursor around. Um, separately, at any time during this event, you'll be able to go to the chat section and you can click on a link, which will take you directly to the Politics and Prose website, where you can purchase a copy of Perestroika in Paris by Jane Smiley. Of course, we highly encourage and thank you uh, for doing so. Uh, that aside, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Jane Smiley. Jane is the author of numerous novels, including A Thousand Acres, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, and most recently, The Last Hundred Years Trilogy, Some Luck, Early Warning, and Golden Age. She is also the author of several works of nonfiction and books for young adults. She is a member of the Acad American Academy of Arts and Letters. She has also received the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award for Literature. Ms. Smiley will be in conversation with Rufy Thorpe, author of Dear Fang with Love, The Girls from Corona Del Mar, which was long listed for the 2014 International Dylan Thomas Prize and for the 2014 Flaherty Dunnan First Novel Prize, and most recently, The Knockout Queen. Without any further ado, Ms. Smiley and Ms. Thorpe. Oh, this is, I'm so just excited to get to talk to you tonight. Um, and I just, I love this book. It is so fun and I'm so excited for people to read it. It's, um, I mean, the, I don't know if you want to summarize it or if you want me to, but um, it's basically the, the story of this curious filly who sort of walks off the track and then becomes friends with a a dog and ultimately two mallards and a crow and a boy and some mice, all of whom are kind of on their own and are sort of like abandoned and they form this sort of magical family. Um, yeah, it, uh, the only thing I'm gonna add is that it begins in the late, in the early winter, so in late no November, around this time of year actually. And so there's plenty of darkness that she can hide in and um, Yes, she's a curious filly, I have to say. Well, I because I associate writing animal consciousness with you, partially like from Horse Heaven or the pig and Moo, and you always do it so well and simply, but what was it like having a whole cast of characters that you had to differentiate in all the different species? Like, how did it change how you thought about their characterization? Well, it was really fun, actually. Um, I think a lot about horse consciousness because that's what you have to do if you want to stay on your horse, uh, if you're a rider and you want to stay on your horse. And if you have several horses over the years, you notice how different they are from one another. And I've explored that before, um, but I also think about it every day. It's something that I think all riders think about. When a horse does something weird, we, instantly say to each other, oh, what do you think she's thinking? What do you think she sees? Um, why do you think this is happening? And this leads you to think about horses in terms of how they think. Um, and so when I thought of, actually it was in 2009 and I was eating uh, onion soup at the Patisserie Carette in the uh, Place de Trocadero on the west side of the bank. Uh, and I looked around, it's such a beautiful spot. And I looked around and I thought, boy, you know, what it would, wouldn't it be fun if a horse escaped from Otoy, which is, it wasn't that far away and came in here and lived in Paris for a year. And then it just that thought just stuck in my mind. Um, it was entirely automatic for me to think from the horse's point of view, but I knew that she couldn't just be alone, that there had to be some other animals and eventually people um, for her to interact with. And the first one I thought of was a dog, which is based on my dog, our dog, my husband's and my dog, um, who's a German short hair. She was, I'm sorry, she got old and she had to be put down. But she was a very interesting dog. She was, her name was Frida. 
And she had in individual qualities too. And so then I just started thinking, well, who might they see? Um, what would their life be like? Um, now, it used to be that the area around the Eiffel Tower was different from the way it is now because they've refurbished it in the last, I think about five years. But it used to be that there was just this little bridge and some ponds. And so it was actually rather a wild area. And so when I walked around it to see what I could see, I did see mallards and I did see ravens. And I thought, oh boy, this is, this will be fun. Um, gosh, there's so many. Well, do you want to read a little bit of it just so people can get like an idea of the flavor of it? <laughs> okay, I'll read a paragraph. I'm not going to read the first paragraph. Um, I, I opened it automatically um, and, and I came to a paragraph on chapter three that I thought was fun. And so I'll read, this is uh, the beginning of chapter three. Actually, it's about the pond. The pond beside the great four-legged brilliant thing that Paris could not see to the top of was inside a low fence. But this time the footing of the approach was fine. Paris backed off five strides or so and popped over it. The grass inside the fence was rich and deep and the water in the pond was good enough. In Paris's experience, everywhere you went, the taste of water was different. Here it was rich and dirty, but with a sweetness too. She was thirsty and drank her fill. Frida soon appeared and she too jumped the fence. Her form was good, Paris thought in spite of the weight of the purse between her jaws. Knees tucked a little kick of the hind legs to clear the top metal bits. Frida took a drink. And then the screaming began. Paris was startled and snorted and reared about Raoul who floated in, he's the raven. Wings stretched and landed on a low branch overhanging the pond, cawed dismissively and said, mallards, common. <laughs> Anas Platerinkos. So he's the know-it-all. The, the raven is the know-it-all. Oh. And um, he was fun to write about, but I got, uh, maybe he, <laughs> like most know-it-alls, eventually my editor said he needs to shut up. So I, oh, <laughs> I, <agree. laughs> I had him learn, I had him learn to hold his tongue a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I found him, uh, there are so many moments where they're observations of each other. And as they're coming to understand each other, like when um, Frida the dog is talking to Paris about racing and saying, what are you guys chasing? <laughs> you know, like how do you, because <laughs> they're a dog, like, well, how could you run without being chasing something? Um, and all their different paradigms. Um, so for Paris, the horse, She's based on your horse. Yes. Um, and the, one of the things that I love most about um, Paris in the book is that she's characterized so much as, as her curiosity, like almost every course changing moment in the book is led on by her like, ah. and when I read it, I didn't know that it was based on your horse. And I was like, what if this is a self portrait? Because I like, <laughs> associate that kind of curiosity with you. But so how did you um, come to write this story about Paris? Well, she, uh, I bred her and that's why I know about her breeding. And um, she spent some unproductive uh, months at the racetrack. Um, but when I was first learning to ride her and teaching her to be ridden by a regular, not very adept person, one of the things I noticed was um, how curious she was. I mean, like a lot of horses, she would, she would look off into the distance and, and try and see what things were going on, but she would do other things too. Like there was a mounting block that had a lid and she would go over to that and nose it open to see if there was anything inside. And there wasn't food inside, there never had been. She just wanted to know. Mm -hmm. um, and when I take her for walks now, she's always, some of the horses just follow me along or they're always looking for my pocket to see if there's a treat. 
but she's always looking off to see what's going on. And um, it just fascinated me about her that she was so curious. And she's, she's also quite a sweetie pie. I mean, she is very careful about my personal space. So um, if she gets spooked, she'll, um, she might jump toward me, but she doesn't touch me. So she's very aware of her surroundings. And that fascinates me about her. Um, she's, she's an interesting horse. And I think all of them are, but she's the one that I, I pay the most attention to and know the best. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite details in the book and my favorite animals were the way that you do the rats. <laughs> and they have this kind of like psychic ability with their whiskers. And at one point, the, the young rat is talking about Etienne, the boy's grandmother, who's very, very old. And he's, he, you write, the broadcast that he got, through, uh, got from her through his whiskers was, he thought, the most interesting thing about her. She gave off almost no signal. According to his rat instinct, she was hardly alive. Maybe not alive. And yet she was <laughs> very active for a dead being <laughs> i just like how uh, this idea of like psychic rats so how did you even go there it's so wonderful. i have no idea i mean i had to do <laughs> some, i wanted the rats because i figured they would be around and i and one of the things i like about writing and writing a book is coming up with new ideas that you hadn't thought of to begin with um and so once paris meets the boy, follows the boy. There has to be something going on in the house. And I thought, well, what's the most likely thing that might be going on in the house? Oh, I know. There could be rats in the walls because it's quite an old house. Um, when, and so I just thought, well, that would be interesting. So then I looked up rats and I looked up how they, what we know about rats. And, and these are black rats, which are different from brown rats. Brown rats are larger and black rats are smaller. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll stick a rat in there and see what I think about it. And so that led me to thinking a lot of new thoughts. And that's what I liked about the rat. Um, I knew that Frida would react negatively toward the rat, but I didn't think that Paris would because horses see rats all the time. And so that made me think about the difference in the way that they um, see the other animals. Um, so all of it was really fun. And, I, and then I got onto the people and those were, they were interesting too. So I, I quite enjoyed all the characters, including um, the people. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I remember thinking that just from sort of like a novelistic perspective. I was like, how is she going to do this? Like, what are the stakes <laughs> that are going to be? Are there going to be human characters? Um, and one of the things that I love so much is that even though the whole thing obviously has like the feeling of kind of like a fantasy because the animals are communicating, the only real magic in the book is um, unexpected kindness and uh, for each other and these moments of protecting each other. And I feel like the book is a lot about um, protection. And Frida has this moment where she observes that when a human and a dog are walking down the street, you don't know who's protecting who. It can go both ways, it's <laughs> ambiguous. But even like they talk about, you know, the house protecting Etienne and his grandmother so that they can live this sort of cocooned life. And um, I guess just, I feel no, like um, one thing it's, it's his great grandmother. Great grandmother. Sorry. He's eight and she's 96 when the book begins. So, um, so she, she calls him, he calls her grandmama, but he knows that she's his great grandmother. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, and I don't know, it made me think about like, um, this thing that Kevin Wilson said when he was promoting his last book. And he said, like, it, we always say that the strong should protect the weak, but I don't think that they really do. I think that it's the weak that protect the weak. And there was something, yeah. 
about that? How did you come to figure out, I mean, because it started as this fantasy, right, of like, what if a horse managed to do this, but how did you figure out what the themes were as you were going along, and how did you think about them? Well, I knew there were a lot of practical issues. Um, for example, how would Paris get fed? Um, I wanted to put Frida in because I, I was crazy about Frida. She was a wonderful, beautiful, and interesting dog. Um, as a German short hair, she was an existentialist, of course. Um, and I wanted to stick her in there, but I didn't want her to belong to somebody who would then notice Paris and mm -hmm. want to do something. So I, I had her, I mean, every time you go to Paris, you see buskers on the on the in in the town or in the city and so i thought okay i'll make frida the the dog of a busker who has died and then i had to think about frida and how she does things and what she does and how she manages to to survive without her owner and so then just thinking about how they who they might see how they would relate to one another what their relationships would feel like to each other. Um, it just got more and more interesting. Um, now, when I was Etienne's age, which is eight, I was absolutely a horseaholic. I watched my friend Flicka. I watched Roy Rogers. I watched all those shows on TV. Didn't give a, didn't give any, didn't have any interest in what the people were doing. I was only interested <laughs> there for the horses and what the horses were doing. And I read a lot of horse books and um, I just, that's what I loved. And so I could really sympathize with him that he would see the horse and be fascinated by it and try to figure out a way to lure the horse. Um, and so then the question was, well, where is he going to lure her to? Where is he, what's, what's going to happen after that? And all of those things were really fun to come up with, all the things that happened in the book. Mm -hmm. um, the real issue was, are the, are the people who take care of the Champ de Mar, which is enormous, um, going to tolerate the existence of a horse. So maybe the most problematic character is, um, I think his name is Pierre, who takes Pierre, care. Yeah, yeah, Pierre, who takes care of the uh, Champ de Mar. And so I made him a nice guy from the countryside who um, doesn't mind seeing a horse in the Champ de Mar. And all of that was fun. I love making stuff up. My whole <laughs> <laughs> My career is about making stuff up and then trying to make it believable. And this was a big challenge, but it was also lots and lots of fun. Oh, yeah. Well, and it's something, it's interesting because part of the reason that he tolerates it is because it charms him. The yeah. idea of this horse and part of the reason the reader accepts it is because the idea is charming. And I feel like this whole... <laughs> It's so, and I feel like that's, I mean, I know you've written a ton about Dickens and, um, and you're obviously very influenced by him, but I feel like in, he had that down, like, and how you make something light enough to be charming, but heavy enough and substantial enough to mean something. Um, and it made me think like, so when you were writing this, because I know you also write the YA novels that are centered around riding and horses. And so mm -hmm. how did you think about readership? Did you know immediately, like, I want to do this about animals, but for grownups? Or did you think, I don't know what kind of story it is? Or how did you? Um, I didn't really think about readership. I wanted it to be what it was. And then I figured, well, it's the publisher's job to figure out who the audience <laughs> is. <laughs> Oh, well, it's perfect. Um, oh, and then my other question. Okay. So do you think that this could have ever happened in an American city? Like, is there something about Paris as even an imaginative locale that makes this like somehow more possible or more believable? Well, you know, for years, there was a riding stable in Central Park in New York. 
So it is conceivable that a horse could escape in Central Park, or it, at one time it was. Uh, I think that stable is gone. The most fascinating thing about that stable was that the horses were kept, uh, uh, I think it was underground or above ground, and they had to ride an elevator up or down to get <laughs> to get outside. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> too much about it, but yeah, there used to be um, horses in Central Park. Could this happen in an American city? Well, the Champ de Mar is so enormous and it is just across from the river. And in some ways that makes it a good, and it's not that far from Otoy. So in some ways that makes it a more potential location mm -hmm. than um, a park in an American city. Um, Central Park is huge and, and I've walked around in Central Park and noticed how private some areas are. But um, I'd like to say, you know, I grew up in St. Louis and there's a big park in St. Louis called Forest Park. I'd like to say it could happen there, but I don't think so. Every so often I think, okay, so what am I going to do with this book? If I, am I going to write a sequel? And if so, what's going to happen? And then I think, okay, I guess Paris will sneak onto an airplane and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and fly to uh, New York or something like that. But, but so far I haven't been able to make that work. <laughs> um, I feel like, every writer has one or two scenes. It's not that you think that they're the best scenes necessarily, but they're the ones that you secretly like the most that like surprised you or um, charmed you in a book. And I was just wondering what yours were for this one. Oh, well, that's a good thought. I, you know, I wish I'd known ahead of time that you were gonna ask that question because okay. there, were, there were some, but, um, one of the issues about Paris in the winter is that she has to get fed somehow. And there's some grass, but there's not a lot. So I had to figure out a way for her to get fed. So um, I walked and I, did, I, unfortunately, I had to do lots and lots of research, which meant I had to go to Paris as much as possible. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, I was walking down um, a road to the right of the park, um, Avenue de Suffren. And I, I noticed a bakery there. And so that seemed like a good place. So it was fun to develop um, the character of the woman in the bakery um, who, who is in, her name is Anais and she makes pastries. She cooks and she cooks pastries. And I thought, okay, it'll be fun to make her an interesting character. And she also has access to the sorts of grains and stuff that Paris could eat. She doesn't have to give her croissant every day. Um, so she can give her some other stuff. So that, that sort of thing was fun. Um, I loved, I don't mean to interrupt, but I loved all the descriptions of the various things that Paris eats. I don't know why I found it so charming, but I was like, and what is she eating now? Like grated beets and wheat berries. And, you know, it, it was just wonderful. Well, the real Paris is a food horse. I always say that there are, there are food horses and play horses. And um, I used to have a horse who, he would be eating his hay. And as soon as you showed up, he'd come over. He's like, like he's saying, okay, what's next? But Paris she loves to eat and she loves all kinds of treats and she's very picky about grass. She'll sniff the grass for five minutes before she's willing to take a, a bite from it. Um, but she's always trying to get to the grass in order to sniff it. And I, that's another thing that fascinates me about her. So, oh, so the Paris in the book is a, is a food horse too. And she's, she's pretty much willing to try all kinds of things. And um, I think horses are like that. Uh, some horses are like that. Other horses, you know, my hay is good enough for me. I don't care. Let's go do something. But, um, but 
so I put in, I, I gave her all kinds of food to eat in this book. Um, so I had wanted to ask you so that you could tell um, the story to everybody about how, because you rode horses when you were younger mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, went off to school and, and started your <laughs> adult life and then got back into it. And so how did you get back into horses? Well, I was, um, I had just about nine months before I'd given birth to my third child, um, little boy. And we had a house when we lived in Iowa at the time. And in the summer, we would go to a house that we had in northern Wisconsin on the Lac de Flambeau uh, reservation. And I was driving around with the nine month old in the back, um, looking for one of those women who sold toys out of her house. And I turned down the wrong road. And lo and behold, there was a horse riding stable. Now, when I was growing up in St. Louis, we had plenty of those, but I'd never seen anything like that in Northern Wisconsin. So I jumped out of the car. I took my son out of his car seat. I put him on my hip and I went over and I watched the lesson. And then I asked the woman who was teaching if she would give me some lessons. She said that she would. And, um, and I, I, I told you this, I stepped toward the fence to thank her and my son's toe touched the electric fence and he cried, but <laughs> maybe that was a bad omen. But anyway, so the rest of the story is that I took a couple of lessons and the second one, she put me on um, this retired racehorse who was an absolute mess. He was 13, no, he was 14 years old. He was bony. Um, obviously the horses that he'd been with for a while had bitten him all over, pulled his tail. And, um, but he was lovely to ride. And I felt all of the, all of the skills about riding, I felt them sort of come back automatically, even though it had been about, oh, what was it? 20 years, 25, even since I'd been on a horse. And so the next day I went and I asked if I could ride him again. And she said, yes. And so I went to where he was and he nickered at me. And I thought, oh, I already, I already am crazy about this guy. <laughs> so I bought him and he turned out to be a wonderful riding horse. Um, he had had a very big racing career. He'd had 52 starts. And then I had, um, I was curious about his pedigree. So I looked it up and he, he was incredibly, uh, he was a world traveler. He was born in Germany, he raced in France. He raced in upstate New York. He, he raced um, all over the place. And I thought, wow, this guy knows a lot. So that was Mr. T and he, ex he inspired horse heaven. Yeah. Um, and so that's what got me back into it. So this oddball horse in Northern Wisconsin, this oddball place. And so here we are. It's, it's kismet. Um, I, there's a point in 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel where you say that like when you picture all of your novels, you picture them on like a darkened plane and that horse heaven is like the biggest and brightest and nearest to you. Do you still picture them that way? How, how do you picture this book? Well, I picture it at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Oh, <laughs> <it's> sparkling. <laughs> it's very sparkly. <laughs> you know, I don't know how much, you had a fair amount of time in between um, the, the last part of the last hundred years and this one, but it's it must, I mean, was it fun getting to do something like smaller in scale and more whimsical and? Oh yeah, it was really fun. And I was working on other projects too. Um, and we were going, and the publisher and I were going back and forth about which ones to focus on. And so about a year and a half ago, I said, you know, I really think maybe this one is the one we should pay attention to. And they said, yeah, let's do that. So we did it. But there's a lot of them. There's others in the, there's others on the, on the, on, on the, the, on the way. I'm excited. 
I am <laughs> very excited. Well, and this one wound up being sort of like this perfect gift since the world is so terrible. You know, oh. it's hard to make yourself read very heavy things about how terrible the world is. And so it's much, yeah. it's lovely to imagine like animals being <laughs> kind to each other in Paris. So my Hollywood agent said, you know, they, she wasn't going to show it to anybody in Hollywood because it didn't have a bad guy. And I said, I don't want a bad guy. You know, they have enough to deal with just dealing with their lives. I'm yeah, not going to stick a bad it. guy in there. So if Hollywood can't tolerate a book with the, or a movie without a bad guy, too bad. Yeah, well, winter really is the bad guy, or I guess sometimes yeah. the gendarmes like the become kind of the bad guy for poor Etienne, who I love. Um, well, do you want to? I'm looking at the time. Should we try and turn it over a little bit to Q and A and see what? Yeah, people... I love Q and A. Q and A is okay. one of my favorite things. So yes, if there's any oh. Q, I've got A's. Um, Cynthia says, all of the horses, how many do you have? Can you talk about this, please? <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, how many the, horses do you have? At the moment, I have three. Um, Paris, um, her younger sibling, well, sort of distant sibling named Ned, and then a horse I've been leasing, um, who's actually, <laughs> he's half thoroughbred and half French warm blood. And so um, he's also extremely elegant, according to him. So I have, <laughs> I have three and um, I ride two of them. Um, Paris has had some health issues lately, so I'm, I'm not riding her at the moment, but I've got others to ride, so. Do you ride every day? Um, about five days a week. I wow. take, I'll take some breaks. Wow. Um, and then, oh, Mary asks, what was your favorite childhood horse book? I want to know the answer to this, too. Well, I loved, I loved Black Beauty, but I didn't like horse books that were sad. I mean, one of my strongest <clears throat> memories of reading horse books as a child was that the horse maybe would die. I know. And, you. you know, Ginger, uh, Beauty's friend, is trotting down the street and falls down on his knees. I, I reread that about five years ago, and I burst into tears then, too. Um, I guess my favorite one was a book called Silver Birch, which is, <laughs> oddly enough, um, about a girl who is dying to have a horse. And she lives on a farm in, yes, Wisconsin. And there's this stray horse running around outside in the woods. And so she goes and tames that horse and brings it. And I guess that was my ideal. Um, I kept looking out the window and saying, where is that stray horse? And actually one time, I guess I was about 13 maybe, I looked out the window and there was a horse in our backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and this is outside of St. Louis and it turned out that it belonged to uh, that a, a girl about my age who lived about well this was in the suburbs so she lived in the next um, road off the next road and it was her horse and he had gotten out and so um, to repay me for finding the horse and uh, letting her know and I don't know how we found out it was her horse but she she repaid me by taking me for a trail ride around along the creek near our house so yeah I, my dream came true the horse was out in the backyard that is amazing <laughs> that because that, that, that is the ultimate sort of wish fulfillment is like that you have this sort of special connection yeah. with an animal um so then Susan asks, I've always loved your characters. How do you develop them? Are they mostly known to you before you write or do they evolve as you write them? And do your characters ever evolve in ways that make the storyline difficult to work out? Um, the answer is yes to the second two parts. I mean, the story I always tell is that when I was growing up, I grew up in a very gossipy family. And um, 
one of the things they liked, they like to talk about their adventures, but they also like to talk about one another. And um, so that made me really interested in psychology, but not, not traditional psychology, more like gossip psychology. Yeah. Um, and so when I do characters, I usually know something about them, a few things about them, but I like them to develop on their own. I like to see what they're going to do on their own. One of the things I did in the last hundred years trilogy was start when the characters were babies. And I did that because I wanted to show how their, how their nature as adults would be on a continuum from their nature as babies. And that's because I noticed that my own children from day one, we're quite different from one another. So I've always been interested in that and in watching the children and watching how they are like me or how they're like their dad or how they're like their relatives. Um, so I love developing characters and I like it when they do unusual things, but I think they also need to, there also needs to be this kind of continuity between the first things they do in the book and then the later things they do in the book. Um, yeah, it's, it's so wild with little kids <laughs> watching them develop this interiority so that yeah. their emotions go from being something you're managing, like it's like a storm or a physical thing, like trying to get them to not cry in the supermarket checkout line to all of a sudden they're like having deep, complicated perceptions. Um, and when they're about 15, they're telling you what to do. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> what style of writing do you do? Janet wants to know. Well, I don't exactly understand the question. Um, I would say that I would say that um, the style is appropriate to the subject. I want the style to be appropriate to the subject, and I've tried lots and lots of different subjects, so um, the style varies from from one book to another. But basically, I like it oh. to be straightforward and communicative. Uh, this is just because I don't have good enough pronunciation. It's writing style. Like I think she meant oh, like writing. Oh, yes, writing. Yeah, writing. The two things sound <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's English, um, and it, I use um, an eventing saddle, so you can, so I can do a little bit of dressage type writing, and I can do a little bit of. Um, cross-country type riding, riding. Um, and that's the most comfortable for me. Um, so, and that's the saddle I can actually lift. One of, one of my trainers um, has started riding Western and the biggest problem for her is carrying the saddle around. So we talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um. What are the other? Okay, so I loved your book, A Thousand Acres, as well as Horse Heaven and Others. Can you talk about how you have changed between serious themes and others that are lighter? Well, the serious themes, I, I would say the most serious books are A Thousand Acres and The Greenlanders. Um, and I was interested in those issues when I was um, in my 30s, basically. But mostly what I was interested in was the forms that literature could take. And so I knew when I started out that I wanted to write a tragedy, an epic, a comedy, and a romance. And... Um, 
the the one I was most focused on figuring out how to put together was the Greenlanders. And so I tried a bunch of other things um, in order to figure out how to make a novel before I actually um, tried the Greenlanders. The reason I did A Thousand Acres was because we were taught it so many times in high school and college. And I don't think that the tragic form is natural to me. Um, I, I, I don't think, but I had always been annoyed by King Lear. I love Shakespeare's other plays, but King Lear always annoyed me because <coughs> Goneril and Reagan don't get to say what's motivating them. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna rewrite King Lear because I wanna talk about Goneril and Reagan and what's motivating them. And um, so that's what I did um, in terms of the tragedy. So the tragedy and the epic were, were King Lear, I mean, excuse me, Thousand Acres and the Greenlanders. But I think comedy is more comedy or mixed, um, mm -hmm. mixed moods, let's put it that way. I think that's more natural to me. So I truly enjoyed writing Moo, which was supposed to be the comic novel. I loved writing it. But I liked the other ones too, because I could go back and forth mm -hmm. between sad, scary, funny, and um, sort of inspiring. And, and that's what I still like to do. I like things that are uh, have differing moods and different types of characters. And I like following, that's what I liked in the trilogy was following the different characters as they made their way through their lives. And some of their lives were worse than others. Um, and they dealt with them differently. Yeah, I feel like whereas some writers wind up sort of writing the same book over and over, one of the things that characterizes you really is that like all your books are so different from each other. And it is part of why reading Paris, I was like, it's Jane, she's, it's the curious silly. <laughs> she's like, she just wants to know like, well, maybe I'll write an epic. I'll write something tragic. I can do tragedy, why not? Um, um, Oh, gosh, well, usually in, in high, when I was in high school and college, we didn't get to read very co much comic fiction. You know, I had to read um, P.G. Wodehouse on my own. I had to read um, Jane Austen on my own. We were constantly assigned, you know, books that scared us, like The Scarlet Letter, you know. But because I love to read, I did read a lot of those books on my own, the lighter books and the comic books. And I learned, I learned a lot from them too. So, um, so I was lucky because I had access to all those other books that we didn't, weren't assigned in school. And so I could think about all, all, the, all the forms. Um. I, it's one of the questions was, are you apprehensive? Were you apprehensive about publishing this book for adults? Were you worried that critics wouldn't take you seriously? And um, um, like, you're Jane Smiley, you can do whatever you want. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always said, you know, as I was talking, my, talking to myself about it for the last 11 years was, this would be my amuse-bouche. So, <laughs> yes. So, you know, what the critics take seriously is up to them. And I just, you know, I just put it out there and they have to do whatever they do. But so far, I'm actually quite amazed and surprised by the positive response. So, yeah. Hallelujah. I am, I am delighted and not at all surprised by the positive <laughs> response. <laughs> um, and then someone asks, what is your favorite book that you've read in the past year? But that is like, I don't, hard sometimes. Oh, there's to be so found. many of them. Um, probably it's this one, which I had, which I had sitting around uh, a long time. 
Um, and I never read it. And then of course, when we were on lockdown, I could read and read and read and read. And this is a really fascinating book about um, one, of the wish, one of the witches in the Salem witch trials who is African-American slave in Massachusetts. And it's from her point of view. And um, I, just, I just couldn't put it down. I thought it was amazing. And wow. I actually quite liked your book too, the the knockout queen. And you know, yes, you made her six feet tall or even a little taller. <laughs> but I didn't take that personally. <laughs> oh, it's it's obviously wish fulfillment. I wanted to be tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there particular writers? that you find are especially inspirational for your own creative process and work or specific books that have fueled your writing? Well, I, in the old days, yes, there were plenty of writers that um, inspired me. Um, but at this point in my career, it's, it's more that, that settings and history are what inspire me. I love historical novels. Um, I, I wish I'd written some more historical novels um, because I love history. And quite often I'll be, I'll be reading or listening to a book about a certain period of, in history and I'd get, I'll get an idea. But settings also inspire me. So um, for example, the, the um, I don't know, let me think of one. Oh, gosh, I can't even remember the ones. But um, there's one th that I really am quite fond of called The All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton about Kansas before the Civil War. And when I went to visit uh, that area in Kansas where Liddy lives, I was fascinated by the variety of the landscape. And I could imagine the, the problems she would have and the difficulties she would have. Um, uh, when I was studying the Norse sagas and I went to Iceland, um, this, the nature of Iceland and how strange it was to someone, to a girl from St. Louis, that I found inspiring. And I knew I wanted to write some kind of a, a saga type book about Greenland. Um, so, you know, all kinds of things inspire me, but usually it's history and um, environments. Well, it's funny because I think it is sort of a similar state of mind trying to like put yourself into a horse's mind and figure out what the horse is thinking, trying to imagine being someone living 200 years ago in a specific place. I mean, there, yeah. it's all sort of this imaginative casting. Um, but I think that I read something about when you were writing Greenlanders that it was like a kind of channeling once you got into it that you, was unpleasant and that you then didn't want to do again after that. Um, it wasn't unpleasant. In some ways, it was too pleasant. Um, and I know why it happened. You know, I, if you're writing a historical novel, you have to choose whether you're going to make it um, straightforward, sort of contemporary style, or you're going to have to try and imitate the old style. And Icelandic and Old Norse have such a different way of expressing things. So the example I always talk about is if you're talking in Old Norse, you don't say last night I dreamt about a horse jumping on top of the roof. You say last night it dreamed me about a horse jumping on top of the roof. And I think that that was really important for me and my understanding of how the Greenlanders saw themselves and their world. So it took me about 50 pages. I'd read all the sagas and, I, and I'd read them all in original, you know, word by word in original Old Norse. But it took me about 50 pages to learn to mimic as close as I could the way that they thought. But once I got there, 
then because of the style, I was kind of swept in to that world. And it did feel like being, like channeling or being taken over in some sense by the, by the characters in the book. Um, I didn't find it unpleasant, but I found it unusual and, and when I, and sort of exhausting in a way. And when I was done, I, I said, I don't think I'm ever gonna do this. I don't think I'll ever feel this again. And I do get deeply involved in all my books, but because of the style of the Greenlanders, it was sort of like putting on this bearskin rug and disappearing, so. Yeah. I liked it, it's I didn't want to do it again though. I can understand why. I mean, it's one of my favorite ones. And my husband and I still call yogurt sour milk like to this day. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have to go to Iceland, you know. Yeah, I gotta go. There. It's interesting. It's so interesting. Um, well, if anyone has any other questions, I don't know um, if... I see there's one that says that is how Paris gets to New York City, but I'm not sure. I think it was in reference to a part of the conversation that we have. <laughs> yeah, we're about to get on the train. <laughs> get on the plane, excuse me. She's going to have to sit way in the back, though. <laughs> we'll notice her. Uh, well, I really hope that somehow we find a way for Paris to go to another city and get to have a <laughs> sequel, because I would, I would follow her anywhere. Well, she's telling me that... Um, as she tells me so many often, so many off, so many times, that this other horse who is now next to her, the one who's a half French warm blood and half thoroughbred, that he's trying to win her affections. And please, would I move them to a nice, beautiful, grassy area outside of oh, Paris? Man. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. One of the things I'm sure I was going to give in, though, because she's quite independent. Yeah, it seems like it would. There would have to be lots of negotiations of freedom there. Yeah, it could go on for hundreds of pages and negotiations. <laughs> There's this wonderful part that where you're talking about um, Etienne's. Like, I don't understand commands. Like, commands are the opposite of how animals are communicating and sort of like how he experiences their um, relationship to each other. And I just, I thought that that was so compelling as an idea. Well, I think Etienne is a, is an interesting kid because he's, he's, because of the way he's been raised, he's had to be more mature in a lot of ways than other kids who are eight years old. Um, and so he has a lot of thoughts that uh, are about, you know, how you get along in the world, a world that he basically hardly knows at all. Yeah, I mean, he's really grown up in a world of books and in an, in an imaginary world, you know. Yeah. Um, and then Elizabeth asks, do you still live in North Carolina? Years ago, you visited my mother's bookshop in Pinehurst and thrilled her with your kindness. Oh, really? No, we only were in North Carolina for about four or five months. It was just a visit. I live in uh, Central California, Central Coast, California now. So um, I liked, I, I really enjoyed North Carolina, I have to say. Well, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. It has been like a real dream come true for me. And I'm so excited about this book and so excited for everybody to read it and, Good. and get to escape for a little while to Paris. Well, thank you for being willing to do this. It was lots of fun and good luck. Thank you. Before we do go, I have one last question for both Rufi and Jane, and that is, um, is there anything you're currently reading? And if so, could you please share that with everyone in attendance? Well, my, the one I'm currently reading or actually listening to on audio is How the Irish Saved Civilization. But I'm very early in the book. So um, 
I'm, ex I'm extremely interested to know how they did that. Um, and we'll see. Um, I'm reading a, a bunch of different things right now for blurbs and things that haven't come out yet. Um, but the book that I'm dying to like get back to for pleasure reading is the Butterfly Lampshade by Amy Dender, who I adore. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both for this wonderful event. Of course, thank you everyone who's attended. Um, once again, feel free to go to Politics Pro's website to purchase a copy of Perestroika in Paris. Um, and that is- And the Knockout Queen, don't forget that one. And the Knockout Queen, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do please get two, both books. <laughs> both books. I wish everybody to stay safe and have a good evening. Thank you very much for having you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.